No, skepticism is awesome. It's, there you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. Hello and welcome to American Free Thought. I'm John Snyder. And I'm David Driscoll. This is show number 131, live at DragonCon. Uh, for the benefit of those who may not be familiar with our podcast, um, we've been around for about four years. It's both a blog and a podcast. We focus on skepticism with relation to religion. Um, we talk about issues of separation of church and state. Uh, the intrusion of organized religion into social policy or society in general. Um, and we also do some classical skepticism, but we're mostly a basically an atheist podcast. That, that's pretty much it. They, I know that this is a skeptics track for all skeptics. We're going to talk a little bit later about skeptics versus atheists. But if, you, uh, if you're into our show, then you're, you're more focused. Every now and then we'll do something on homeopathy or something like that. But for the most part, we're skeptical of religion. Right. And um, as I mentioned before, I'm John Snyder. Uh, a lot of people at DragonCon might know me from the 10 years that I did SciFiDimensions.com, which was an online uh, science fiction magazine. What was that? Oh, I thought I heard somebody say something. <laughs> we got a, <laughs> George ho we got a hoedown going on yeah. behind us. Um, but anyway, I started uh, American Free Thought in the fall of nine, uh, 2007. Yeah, and then we started the podcast about two months later, so. Yeah, it's hard to believe it's been that long, but it's, it's been that long. <laughs> yeah, so, and I live here in Metro Atlanta, and uh, David lives in Metro DC, so. I abandoned the Deep South for the Mid-South, and it's pretty much just as bad when it comes yeah. to religion, so. Right. Moving right, right along? Sure. So, when we start our shows out, we usually just kind of talk amongst ourselves a little bit about a couple different topics. And in the show notes, Chris calls it badinage, B-A-D-I-N-A-G-E. Specifically, I call it we make with the badinage. We make with the badinage. And of course, that's always just been in the show notes. We've never talked about it. So I actually looked the word up and uh, <laughs> finally to see if he, was, if he was just pulling my leg or not. And it's a talk that's humorous, playful, and bantering. So there you go. So I did want to do a little bit of talk, a little bit of badinage, uh, because we just haven't seen each other in almost a year. Uh, you guys came down for the Rally to Restore Sanity. Yes. And I uh, got to see you when you came to D.C., but other than that, you know, we haven't seen each other a lot. That's so I, I thought we should do a little bit I of... I you, man. I know. It's been hard. <laughs> it's been hard. I, we, we, do, we do our show, even when I lived in Atlanta, we did our show via Skype. But it's just not the same when it's that fuzzy little picture on the screen and, <laughs> and seeing you face to face. Yeah. So... So one of the first things we want to talk about was Hurricane Irene. Um, we did survive Hurricane Irene. I know a lot of damage happened up in the very far northeast, but in Virginia it wasn't all that bad. And it was so funny for us, we, uh, we took all of our stuff off the deck. My wife has all these flower pots and I grow jalapenos, so I wanted to make sure everything was safe. We took everything off the deck and nothing got damaged. Everything was great. Wake up the next morning, the sun is shining. I go out, I put the umbrella back up. Within 10 freaking minutes, a wind gust comes, knocks the umbrella up, smashes it. <laughs> so, really thrilled. And the same thing happened to me last year. So I'm out, I'm, uh, every, every year pretty much now, I'm out about 120 bucks for an umbrella, no matter what I do. So that was our Hurricane Irene. <laughs> but, and then the other big event that's happened since I saw you was the Virginia earthquake. And yep. I used to live in Los Angeles, so I felt earthquakes. And I know what they feel like, and, and I understand the people that were kind of making fun of us uh, that lived on the West Coast. But I tell you, it was really something to feel. I was on the third floor of my office building, and the whole thing really shook like crazy. Uh, they evacuated our building. We, um, I work for a large uh, payment network, and we had a, a massive data center that actually can run the entire globe right next to our <laughs> office building, so they don't take any chances. And they evacuated us. We were all out there. You know, People were completely freaking out who had never felt an earthquake. And it was really neat. But I tell you, some of the... <laughs> Some of the uh, pictures that were sent around about the damage were just darn right insulting. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen this one, you know, oh, my yogurt dish fell over. It's like, oh, I know. You know, this came from all the West Coasters. And then, you know, we will rebuild. <laughs> Knocked over the lawn chair. Oh, sorry, guys, I know. 
But what about this picture? What I thought was funny was this, this actual picture kind of went a little viral within the next couple days. That same picture, we will never forget, 8-23-2011. That started flying around the interwebs. And there's even t-shirts with that little, you know, that lawn chair thing. So it's, it's amazing in this meme and in this media how quickly things can pick up. Have you seen the one with George Bush kicking over the chair says it was an inside job? I did. <laughs> I've seen that too. There, I, I, know, I, I had to limit what I was going to put because, I, I mean, on my Facebook account and just in general email, I got so many of these things. It was, yeah. it was really kind of fun. And this is all Poseidon's wrath for our unfaithfulness, both the earthquake and the hurricane. I wondered how long it was going to be before somebody started you know, blaming it or claiming that God, this is God's message, that we had a, b both a earthquake that didn't really hurt anything and a hurricane that completely skipped Washington, D.C. Right. It didn't take long, actually. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So it's just amazing. So the other topic we wanted to talk about is your shoes. Yes, we wanted to talk about yes, my shoes. We wanted to talk about your shoes. So for those of you who don't uh, go to the American Free Thought blog, which you should, um, you probably don't that? know about uh, John's shoes. So here they are. And who does not know what that is? Oh, there's got to be a million people who have oh, no okay. clue what that is, yes. It's Tim Minchin from Storm. So I, have, I actually have them on. I was going to pass them around, but then I would I'd end up walking around shoeless the rest of the con. But no, Tim Minchin is sort of a uh, uber skeptic singer, songwriter, comedian. He was here in Atlanta just a month or two ago. And um, I guess most of you are familiar with the animated uh, short Storm, where he encounters sort of a, a hippie who thinks that uh, alternative medicine is the answer to everything. And, uh, but anyway, the daughter of one of my coworkers takes these Walmart shoes and turns them into work of art, works of art. So. Now I have Tim Minchin shoes. Oh, yeah, very impressive. I mean, she's a good little artist. How old is she? 19. 19, yeah. That was, that was just amazing. So anybody wants to see, excuse me, see his shoes after, you know, come on <laughs> up and he'll show you his shoes. But she did such a good job on that. You know, the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit before we get into the more prepared uh, stuff for our show was last night uh, was the mm -hmm. star party that we had. And I, or now that we had, that we attended. Um, that was done by the Atlanta skeptics. Um, I know, I know some people were here, but how many people were there at the star party? Okay, good. Yeah, look. So oh, great. you missed out. Yeah. So those of you who didn't, I tell you, get your tickets early. It, that it, to me, it, that's really the highlight of Dragon Con. Over the last couple of years, that star party has really become the highlight of Dragon Con. Uh, you get to spend a, kind of closer time with people because it's not such a big group. Uh, you get to just hang out, and there's so much free time where you're just standing around and talking. And then, of course, you hear the great lectures by Phil Plate and Pamela Gay. Mm -hmm. uh, just fantastic. So the, uh, the telescope was a little iffy this year. They have a 24-inch observatory, a telescope in an observatory. And it was a little bit hazy. They were trying to show us a nebula. I think I saw my eyelash, and that was about it. <laughs> but uh, but it was, it's really neat, so I really encourage folks to do that. So. Okay. All right. Uh-oh, one more now, well, now we get into one of my favorite people. So, <laughs> now I know DJ was up here saying that it's not good just to tell everybody that, you know, how bad things are and kind of to ridicule religion and stuff. But, you know, it's my job. I have to a little bit. So, um, I've picked on, on Pat so many times just because it's so much fun. And so it is. Skepticism is fun. When you can pick on somebody who really deserves it, like Pat Robinson, it's fun. And I also think it's important because this man is very, very influential. When he says stuff, people listen. There's a whole group of people who live off his every word, including my mother-in-law. <laughs> so it's, it's really important. And I wanted to show what he had to say about the earthquake. So let's uh, switch out of here. Mm -hmm. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I don't want to get weird on this, so please take it for what it's worth. But it seems to me the Washington Monument is a symbol of America's power. It has been the symbol of our great nation. We look at that monument and we say this is one nation under God. Now there's a crack in it. There's a crack in it and it's closed up. Is that a sign from the Lord? Is that something that has significance or is it just a result of, a, of an earthquake? You, you judge, but I just want to bring that to your attention. That it seems to me symbolic. You know, when Jesus was crucified and when he died, 
the curtain in the temple was rent from top to bottom. I mean, it was just kind of, and there was a tear, and it was extremely symbolic. Is this a, is symbolic? Uh, you judge. Yeah. Good old Pat. It's just so hard to go wrong with him. He's always got something just nutty to say. So the other thing I want to remind people of, and I'm sure that everybody saw this, but I also want to remember on a, a much greater tragedy that happened with the earthquake in Haiti, what our friend had to the say. The Reverend Pat Robertson made some controversial remarks about the earthquake in Haiti on the Christian Broadcast Network. Robertson says the reason Haiti is suffering from the devastation is because the nation made a pact with the devil to free itself from French rule. Something happened a long time ago in Haiti, and uh, people may not want to talk about it. They were under the heel of the French. Uh, you know, Napoleon the Third and whatever. And they got together and swore a pact to the devil. They said, we will serve you if you'll get us free from the French. Mm. True, story. True story. And so the devil said, okay, it's a deal. And uh, they kicked the French out. You know, the Haitians revolted and got themselves free. But ever since, they have been cursed by, by one thing after the other, desperately poor. Robertson compared Haiti with its neighboring country, the Dominican Republic, which shares the same island. He said the Dominican Republic is prosperous while Haiti is in poverty. Yeah. And one of the things I, you know, this video obviously shows, you know, he's getting a little long in the tooth, and it's, but he, of course he was crazy when he was younger too. But I love the, I don't know who this young lady is that's sitting next to him, because I really don't watch this show. But she, I can't tell with her expression, is she saying like, oh man, did you just open up a shit storm here? Or is she really trying to believe him? It's hard to believe, she's just kind of looking at him like, hmm. No, I think she was mastering her poker face. Yes, I think so. But she has to know that he's just a little bit out there. So I think it's just important to remember, even though these are some, you know, older, older clips of our friend Pat, that he um, is a very dangerous man, just like Jerry Falwell is a very dangerous man. And we, it's good to ridicule sometimes when ridicule is absolutely necessary. I have another video that I won't play either where he actually called the uh, Haitian earthquake a blessing in disguise. Yeah. And of course then the people in Haiti didn't like that very much. They're like, you know, come down here, we'll show you a blessing. But, yeah. <laughs> and remember, this is also the guy, and then I'll leave him alone, who blamed Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, which of course was one of the worst catastrophes we've had here in the U.S., on homosexuals in New Orleans. You know, so this is what happens when your mind is so polluted, really, by the literal belief in a supernatural being that can have control over things like earthquakes, like hurricanes. Uh, very sad that he is one of the more influential peoples in our society. Okay, now we're going to play a little game called Skeptic, Atheist, Agnostic, Freethinker. Um, every year here at DragonCon, there's some discussion either up here or out in the hallways about, you know, why are there atheists here at the skeptic thing, you know? And the atheists are like, why are there Methodists here at the skeptic thing? <laughs> so I thought it would be interesting to talk about what, how we see ourselves, how the world sees us and what, what is the interrelationship between these different terms and, and demographics. Uh, first of all, I usually run right to the dictionary um, and then there's, go ahead, popular perception. Can I just have that? Yeah, why don't you Okay, this will help. Um, there's the popular perception and then there's, of course, how we, how we see ourselves. And uh, I was very proud of David looking up badinage in the dictionary. <laughs> After like so. three months of you know, having it on our show notes, not knowing what the hell it meant. Right. So let's look at the dictionary definition. Um, a skeptic, I, I have pulled up two dictionaries and just put the uh, uh, definitions in. <clears throat> says a skeptic is one who doubts, questions, or disagrees with assertions or generally accepted conclusions, or one skeptical in religious matters. Now, if that's all you ever read, that doesn't really seem to bear a lot of resemblance to what goes on in here during a Dragon Con weekend. Freethinker is one who has rejected authority and dogma, especially in religious thinking. Some dictionaries stop right there, uh, but others say in favor of rational inquiry and speculation. So you can see that just going to the dictionary can sometimes lead you in an odd direction. An atheist, of course, that's an easy one, one who disbelieves or denies the existence of God or gods, or one who believes that there is no deity. 
and then get ready for this load, agnostic. One who believes that there is no proof of the existence of God but does not deny the possibility that God exists, or a person who holds the view that any ultimate reality, as God, is unknown and probably unknowable, broadly one who is not committed to believing in either the existence or the non-existence of God or a God. So now you know why agnostics are so annoying. <laughs> okay, let's look at the popular perceptions of skeptics, and I'm sure that you have seen some of these before. Um, people, when, when you mention what's this, who's this, you go out on the street and just ask somebody, what is a skeptic? And they'll say, oh, it's a doubting Thomas. You know, it's just somebody who's a contrarian. You know, somebody who's a, a naysayer, they're, you know, a wet towel or a party pooper. Or, if they actually know what a skeptic is, they'll say, oh, you're just a shill for big pharma. And if that's true, where's my paycheck? Other people think that skeptics are just smug, self-congratulatory know-it-alls who think they're smarter than everybody else. So, now, if, raise your hand if you've never heard one of these. Okay, raise your hand if you've heard all of them. Oh, boy. I've never been called a wet towel. Oh. Yeah, I've yeah. never been called a wet towel. All right, towel. well. <laughs> now let's look at atheists. Now, as you probably know, atheists are at the bottom of the heap when it comes to who people in America say they trust. Below homosexuals, below African Americans, below just about, you know, Mormons or any other small demographic, uh, atheists are at the bottom. But, so if you ask people what's an atheist, they say, oh, it's just somebody who's immoral. It's, uh, they're libertines, they're sexual libertines. Uh, I love this one, atheists believe in nothing. Okay, I don't believe in your God, so I don't believe in anything else. They're un-American. They're God-haters. And uh, I like this one, too, because there actually is a term for God-haters, misotheist. That's somebody who really believes that God exists, but hates his guts. <laughs> People also think of atheists as party poopers. And then they also think of them as baby-eating, virgin-sacrificing, flag-burning sodomites. <laughs> Yeah, to which I say nobody's perfect. <laughs> and I heard somebody say recently, we're not all baby eaters, but somebody's got to put food on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could take credit for that. But. Now, this is interesting. Since we chose to call our podcast American Free Thought, popular perception of free thinker is, what's a free thinker? Because every time I have the elevator conversation, and mention free thought or free thinker, I have to go into this big thing. But if I say atheist, they're done. You know, so they're like, oh, an atheist, okay. Um, of course, free thinkers are also smug, self congratulatory know it alls who think they're smarter than everybody else. And by the way, free thought, we get this occasionally f through our podcast. Free thought does not mean that you have to revisit and repeatedly indulge as valid every possible outdated, crack-brained, unsupportable worldview. And I'm specifically talking to the fundamentalist evangelical creationists who email us and say, I started listening to your podcast and I thought, hey, I'm a free thinker, but you're not free thinkers at all. You've only hold, you're, you're only supporting one side of it. To which I say, well, I have considered all sides and I'm not gonna keep going over and over something that's completely you know, uh, invalid. Just a quick historical tidbit. Free thinkers historically included not only atheists, but any kind of unorthodox believer, deists, um, uh, you know, some people consider Unitarians to be um, free thinkers, <clears throat> uh, ethical culture, ethical culturists? Yep. Ethical culturists, yeah. 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 And all sorts of other kind of peculiar types. But uh, over time, um, free thought began to sort of solidify as um, more of an atheist philosophy that relied on rational inquiry. And uh, free religionists are, are, that's sort of a, um, if you ever know anything about or, or read about ethical culture, <clears throat> uh, they're, they're people that want to introduce sort of individuality and rationalism to religion, which I think is a losing proposition. Does somebody have some water? <coughs> Can you... <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask my beautiful assistant, Allison, to bring me some water. Yay! <laughs> now, now you see when on the podcast when I say, look for the redhead and you'll find me. <laughs> Thank you. David, you've been awfully quiet. I'm listening with bated breath. All right. 
Anyway, over time, mainstream free thought, if there can be such a thing, became characterized by rational inquiry and not just unorthodoxy. Okay, I'll pick on the agnostics one more time and then we'll be done. Uh, an agno uh, this is popular perceptions, right? You ask people what's an agnostic and they'll say, oh, it's just somebody who doesn't want to admit that they're an atheist. Or they're, they're a fence sitter, you know, they, they're vacillate. They're, they're wishy-washy vacillating milk toasts. Or as R. Kirby Godsey, who's the former president of Mercer University that's here in Georgia, said to me, agnostics are too obsessed with their questions to be interested in anybody's answers which most people that are agnostics would be very surprised to hear that. Okay, now how do we see ourselves? Atheists see themselves as rationalists, as forward-thinking lovers of science and human progress, as misunderstood crusaders against superstition and for the public good. Skeptics see themselves as rationalists, forward-thinking lovers of science and human progress, and misunderstood crusaders against superstition and for the public good. So I would say that we have quite a bit in common and uh, so it should not come as any surprise to someone who it, uh, joins the skeptic movement that they're going to encounter atheists frequently. Somebody mentioned uh, uh, the elevator speech, you know, what, what is a skeptic, be prepared to talk about it. And one of the best definitions comes from Tim Farley who's probably not here. Anyway, he said, skepticism is the intersection of science education and consumer protection. We help people learn from science to avoid spending their money on products and services that do not work. And uh, if you don't know Tim, he's the founder of whatstheharm.net, which is a, a great resource. Um, ha and with apologies to Tim Farley, skepticism, I say, is the intersection of science education, consumer protection, and pop culture. Because let's face it, the guilty pleasure of the skeptic movement is delving into debunkery of UFOs, of, uh, you know, weeping icons, uh, um, what else, uh, Sasquatch, you know, Bigfoot and that sort of thing. <clears throat> so skeptics do spend a lot of time just sort of laughing at the goofy people that think that UFOs exist. Also, skeptics are not perfect and they're not perfectly consistent. Uh, oops, you can't read that very well, but as Pin Gillette said, everybody got a gree gree, your little fetish that you can't give up. Um, or as I like to say, every skeptic has his woo, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, I'm amazed at the number of self-described skeptics that I have met who think that ESP is complete BS, that UFOs have a perfectly rational explanation, but homeopathy works and has been proven to work. I've met, I have met skeptics who think that homeopathy is the biggest crock on the planet, but they are convinced that ESP is real. Um, or they think that their kids are the best kids on the whole planet, even though they're complete brats. So, so that when I say every skeptic has his woo, you can't expect everybody to be totally rational all the time. So, you know, don't be surprised if your assumptions are challenged at some point. Well, it's actually really amazing on this one. We had a a skeptic who, and an atheist who worked really hard in a couple of the different groups that I worked in and all of a sudden he comes out as a 9-11 truther and just went, went completely gung-ho about it and whenever we mentioned um, anything against 9-11 in our podcast we'd get an email oh right boy. off the bat saying you know oh no don't you know and haven't you seen loose change and he, he dedicated his retirement to studying why 9-11 was an inside job yet he was a pure atheist who did a lot of good work for the atheist movement so just amazing right the other thing is again this is the thing like with free thinkers where people think they know what a free thinker is and and they're offended that you know my definition doesn't include them there are people who are, are self-described, like the 9-11 skeptic, for example, is somebody that just denies. They're not really a skeptic, they're a denier. Um, but uh, I've, I've run into quite a few people that say, well, I'm a skeptic, you know, I think 9-11 was an inside job, or, or I think that Barack Obama was actually born in, where was he born? Kenya. Kenya, <laughs> you know. So what can you do? Okay. Now, since this is my favorite, atheism. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was uh, the assumptions that people make about atheists. We, we talked earlier about how they define them as people that are immoral or they're un-American, which is not necessarily true. But 
I'm in the camp that maintains that atheism is not really a belief or a belief system. It's nothing more than a narrowly focused non-belief. And the only reason it exists is because the opposite of it is so prevalent. You don't, you've never heard of an aposidonist, you know, you've never heard of an azusist because there's not some significant percentage of people that believe in that for it to be a problem. So the only reason the word atheist exists is because it, it is so unusual with respect to mainstream thought. You can be an atheist for irrational reasons. You know, if you, if you think that the world sucks and that a loving creator could not have, have done this because the world sucks and that's why you're an atheist, that's not really a rational belief. It's a reason to disbelieve in a certain kind of God, but it's not a rational belief, you know, against God in general or a creator God. Nothing necessarily follows from the fact that you're an atheist. Um, and, uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare herself said, I am not an agnostic, nor a rationalist, nor a realist, nor a secularist, nor humanist, nor any other fancy name behind which people must hide in order to be safe in our society. Or as uh, Robert Wright once wrote, atheism has little intrinsic ideological bent. Karl Marx, Ayn Rand, I rest my case. Atheists can even be superstitious. I was reading an article this morning. Uh, Sam Harris was promoting a book about uh, Buddhism, and he was pointing out that Buddhists are atheists, but they have a lot of uh, supernatural beliefs in spirits. And do they believe in chi? I forgot. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, again, atheists can be liberal, conservative, socialist, objectivist, libertarians. Uh, but there's no denying the fact that the modern atheist movement is overwhelmingly. Uh, dominated by people that you would consider uh, political liberals. Huh? Oh, and here's one to just blow your mind. 14% of Americans who self-describe as not believing in God or a higher power also define themselves as Christians. This was a Pew Research poll. So this is not some, you know, crack-brained um, uh, poll that somebody came up with. But that just blew me away that uh, there are atheists out there who call themselves Christians. Right. Well, of course, there are a lot of atheists who call themselves cultural Jews. So I, was, I wondered that's if true. that's kind of where that came in. Um, right. But I wasn't sure. When you just look at the polls straight out, it's like, I don't believe in God, I'm a Christian. Right. Remember Julia Sweeney, when she came out as an atheist, her mother said, you know, it's one thing if you don't believe in God, but an atheist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now that we've determined that atheists... Now, let me just ask... Show of hands, how many people think that there is an inherent conflict between atheism and skepticism? And how many people think that they can, and nobody raised their hand, how many people think they can easily cohabitate? So most We're everybody. Good. So we get people so, that agree with us. Okay. That's the problem. We're always preaching to the choir. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing is, when to pop your claws? Never, basically. Just always be respectful to the other person. Now, we, we do occasionally on our podcast because we do offer infotainment, uh, is we do mock people that have some religious beliefs, but usually it's people that kind of have it coming. You know, I'm not mocking just uh, the housewife who sits there and watches TV and sends money to some crazy preacher. I'm mocking the crazy preacher because he should know better and probably does. But you should always be respectful to the other person because my first reaction when people say, oh, I think homeopathy is real. My first reaction is, you've got to be kidding me. You know, have you not read anything? But I, you know, I'm like, well, why do you think that? And try to, to drill down, and maybe they don't really under, understand what homeopathy is. Maybe they're thinking of another term. You know, who knows? <clears throat> also, know when to keep your trap shut. Uh, you know, I'm an atheist. I don't go around at the office talking about it. Probably wouldn't help my career. Um, but if somebody organizes a vaccine drive, I'm not going to go back there and... and and uh, to help and say, you know, who here is a Methodist? So I can be offended that Methodists are being involved in vaccinations, you know. Uh, but if somebody said, well, I don't believe vac vaccines are real, and they're there at the vaccine drive try as a volunteer, then, you know, you have a conversation. But, um, you know, if I heard somebody say, God bless you, when I sneeze at the vaccine drive, I'm not going to pick a fight at that moment. You know, I think this particular one also comes with the time that you've been uh, an out atheist, I guess. When I first started becoming a little bit more active um, and, you know, telling people I was an atheist, 
I, I kind of wanted that little fight. I was waiting for somebody to challenge me because I had my whole list of stuff ready to say. <laughs> and now that it's been, you know, several years, it's kind of like, ah, eh, whatever. Is it really worth, you know, pissing off your neighbor? Yeah. So, um, as I said, focus on the common cause. If you if you're going to a skeptic's meeting to learn about uh, why homeopathy is a crock, then that should be your focus. Conflict is inevitable. As I mentioned, you're going to run in, every skeptic has his woo. So you're going to run into people that don't believe things that you believe and vice versa. So that's true of any, any collection of more than one person. And don't be easily offended because, frankly, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, if people say that or if they're offended by some opinion that I have, that's your problem. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be too easily offended simply because someone's challenging what you think. And, you know, you are entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts. So keep that in mind as well if you get into a conversation with somebody. Is, uh, is what you're maintaining just something that you see as a given, that you've always believed and you're not really sure why? Or do you have facts to back it up? Well, there you go. So now everybody should so that's, be clear. That was that. All right. So are we going to cue the music? We are going to cue the music Ooh. because we don't want to miss that. So... There we go. I can't hear it. I can't hear it either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that ethereal music can only mean one thing, and that's the Holy Scripture. We spell that H-O-L-E-Y because we think all of the sacred texts are full of holes. This is our ongoing project to expose the inaccuracies, inadequacies, contradictions, and sometimes downright cruelty contained in holy books like the Bible. So what do you have for us this time? All right. Well, first, uh, for those who are new to the show, I want to uh, kind of who that music is. That is actually my wife. So, and she used to sing with a uh, acapella group that did uh, mostly religious music. <laughs> so, so it's my wife singing Ave Maria. And uh, I know it's kind of weird to have that show, that song on an atheist show, but it works fine, and, and she doesn't seem to mind. So, not a problem. I need good theme music, by the way, for when we start to explore the Quran. So if anybody has suggestions, let me know. <laughs> well, normally on the Holy Scripture, we go ahead and take apart, uh, it's been almost all the Bible for the last four years, because that's what I've known more than any of the other holy right. books. And that's what's most problematic for us in right. our culture, I would say. It is. We did a few segments on the Quran, and I was actually going to start out this week uh, with the Book of Mormon. Uh, but I decided after talking to some ex-Mormons, some are, who are here, that I think it needs more attention and I'm, I want to do some interviews and really start getting into Mormon beliefs as we start running up to the uh, election again with Mitt, Mitt Romney coming along. It's, it's always good to really know what's going on in their head as they're running for uh, the president of our country. So for this one, I wanted to talk about, I know, I know I'm an atheist, but I do have beliefs. And I have a very strong belief in a particular deity, believe it or not. Now, I know that a lot of people think that atheists, uh, people who don't really know what that means, that means that you believe in the devil. So, and of course, that doesn't make any sense, because if you don't believe in God, you can't believe in the devil. So, no, <laughs> I don't believe in the devil. And if you listen to one of our old shows, boy, it had to be three years ago, when we discussed a, an argument that I get into with a neighbor, and their excuse for everything that goes wrong was little devils. So I found this <laughs> picture of a little devil, and I just thought it was so cute. So... But no, the deity that I, I think, believe in is not I think not that the, kid has a leptid deficiency. It could be. Yeah, I don't know. But he, oh. I think he's awfully cute. And so, and I know this is Dragon Con, but I hate to tell you, I don't believe in Sauron. He is the creator of the ring to rule all rings, but it's Dragon Con, so I had to find some type of science fiction <laughs> thing to throw in here. So That's fantasy. Oh, is that fantasy? See, I don't even know the difference. So <laughs> <laughs> It's awesome, but it's not science fiction. There you go. Okay. Well, so I don't believe in him either. I believe in a much, much more powerful deity. The Flying Spaghetti Monster. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, Let's hear it from the Pastafarians in the Shiz that's house. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and as you said, those of us who believe in the Flying Spaghetti Monster are, are called Pastafarians. So it's, it's funny on my Facebook account. I don't have too many things about my atheism on my Facebook account because a lot of my high school friends and all that are on there too. But under religion, I do have Pastafarian. And it's so funny when some, an old high school friend will find you and go, a, a what? You know? <laughs> so, and I think that the Flying Spaghetti Monster lately, it kind of peaked, and I think it's kind of gone down a little bit. So that's why I wanted to do a Holy Scripture, to, to remind people that he's out there and that we still have to believe in him and what's going on with him. 
Um, so I have the same argument to prove to myself that he is the one true God. I mean, Christians or any other religion, they have, they know that he is their one true God. He just happens to be their God. Well, mine happens to be this guy. You can't disprove him. There's no way to disprove that he, you know, you can't say he does not exist. So he must be real. That's the argument we hear all the time from Christians. And I tell you, the biggest one for me is it really makes me feel better to believe in him. You know, how many times have you heard that? Oh, it makes me feel better to be a Christian. It makes me feel better to know that somebody's looking over me. It makes me feel better to know that he's looking down on me. Plus, so, he's so yummy. Yo, yeah, exactly. So, you know, he speaks personally. When I'm, I'm jogging or something, all of a sudden these voices will come in my head. It's got to be from the flying spaghetti monster. Who else would want to <laughs> talk to me? So, it makes me feel good. Now, the other argument we get from Christians on why their God is real is that so many people believe in him. Oop, oop, there we go. There are millions of other Pastafarians. Just go on their website and you'll see there are millions of us. So since there are that many people that believe in him, must be real. And just like Jesus and Mary often do, he appears on grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> So I don't know how you can say he's not real. Now, the only thing that I got wrong was, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before, um, the Flying Spaghetti Monster showed up here at Dragon Con and actually did a little breeze through behind while we were talking. And it turns out that the Flying Spaghetti Monster is actually a girl. <laughs> so I, I always thought it was a male deity, but it turns out it's a female deity. And here, here she is. Uh, touching him with his noodly, her noodly appendage. <laughs> so that, that's, for those of you who don't know, Pastafarians want to be touched by the noodly appendage of the flying spaghetti monster. So if this character is around, you'll, you'll see people kneeling every time they go near them. Now let's talk a little bit about the actual church. It came into the mainstream in 2005 during the Kitzmiller versus Dover Board of Education trial. And it was really, of course, just a satire illustrating intelligent design, saying, you know, it's not science, guys, but it's a pseudoscience manufactured by Christians to push creationism onto public schools. And here's some of the beliefs that we as Pastafarians have, according to the website. So that's our Bible, is the website. With millions, if not thousands, of devout worshipers, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is widely considered a legitimate religion, even by its opponents mostly fundamentalist Christians, who have accepted that our God has larger balls than theirs. <laughs> now, the tenets of the church are very important. By design, the only dogma allowed in the church of the flying spaghetti monster is the rejection of dogma. We believe that pirates, who were the original Pastafarians, were peaceful explorers, and it is due to Christian misinformation that they have an image of outcast criminals today. Uh, Pastafarians are very fond of beer, <laughs> Every Friday is a religious holiday, and we don't take ourselves too seriously. <laughs> so those are our tenets. And the Church of the Flying yeah, I can't even say it. The Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is a great example of a movement that really couldn't have taken off without the internet and social networks. You know, it, it just wouldn't have exploded as fast as it did without it. So for those of you who are, who are not Pastafarians, I want you to go ahead and join the church. Go to www.venganza, V-E-N-G-A-N-Z-A dot org, or you can just search for Flying Spaghetti Monster, it'll pop right up. And you can proudly let others know of your devotion to the one true God, and you can even buy a car emblem, that one's mine right there, that's what I have in the back of my car, and I have gotten lots of comments, and, and I think every time somebody honks at me, it's got to be just because they're, they're agreeing with me, not that I just cut them off or something, so... <laughs> You keep on holding to that theory. <laughs> That's right. So look for those symbols, and then you'll know that you're among your fellow Pastafarians. So that's the Holy Scripture. Yay! Uh-oh. You can big back that up a little bit first. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the preview. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we also do on the show from time to time is read uh, listener. I always want to say viewer feedback, but nobody's viewing us. Uh, listener feedback. Um, and I asked people for some ideas for us that they wanted to hear uh, discussed um, here at Dragon Con and the thing about atheists and skeptics was one of them uh, but there's another one that uh, was sent to us by a listener named Bill and he says I am you can go to the next slide I am fascinated with the fact that it requires many months or years to unwind theistic beliefs completely and fully employ critical thinking skills why is it so uh, mentally difficult to unwind these belief patterns. What tools should be employed? It took me, 
build nearly a year to unwind my belief structure and I was only starting from a deist standpoint. Part of me wishes we could come up with a, well we'll go on to that in a minute, but um, it's an interesting idea because um, I think if you were a Bible believing church going Baptist and you woke up one morning and you turned over to your wife or husband and said, I'm an atheist today. That wouldn't be the mark of somebody who had suddenly begun thinking rationally. That would be the mark of somebody that appears to have lost their senses or their sense of identity at least. So I think part of the reason it's so difficult is, uh, as Ben Goldacre, either, either he said it or a lot of people have attributed it to him. Uh, you cannot reason people out of a position they did not reason themselves into. So, uh, you know, if it was a matter of just laying the facts on the table, make, making a decision, you know, nobody would be a religious for any length of time, in my opinion. Um, but while people can use reason, they are ultimately driven by their emotions. And I think this is the key to why it takes so long for people to um, kind of come out of it. There's, all, there's the fear of rejection by family and friends. Uh, fear of reprisal by family and friends or at your job or socially. Uh, a fear of embarrassment and by that I mean uh, your momentum. You know, if you're a 60 year old man and you want to come out of the closet as an atheist, people are going to, norm, you know, rightly ask, you know, well, what took you so long? You know, why, why all of a sudden, you know, have you changed your mind about this? Uh, you know, it's just much, much easier to stay the course than to take a radical change of direction. So he, he continues and he says, part of me wishes we could come up with a three-step challenge for theists to prove their faith. I am sure their God would not mind. First, read two books from the following list of books and you would show them a list of, of skeptic-related books. Step number two, listen to two religiously skeptical podcasts for four months. And, of course, you could recommend American Freethought or any number of other podcasts. And then three, read the Bible cover to cover. Um, I forgot who it was that said one of the quickest ways to become an atheist was to read the Bible. So this is Bill's recommendation for uh, how to deconvert a theist. And, of course, when he says read the Bible, he's obviously talking about deconverting Christians, but the same would be true of... Um, people of any other religion. So, uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think especially on the the read the Bible. Now, that's a that's a really big undertaking. So, it, it's I would actually try to pick out some of the more uh, nasty books and say, well, you know, you believe that this is all the Word of God. Every single thing in here has been dictated. So, let's look at uh, Leviticus. Let's look at First and Second Kings. You know, let's go and look at some of the ones where it's just, they're hideous. All it shows is this jealous tyrant of a god who wants to kill people for whatever. The more blood, the better. <laughs> um, how homosexuals should be killed. You know, how, oh, it's just terrible stuff in there. So uh, that's what I'd recommend it, to start them out, as opposed to just saying, you know, go for the next eight months and read the, this 1,400-page book. And on listening to this uh, podcast, one of the best things about doing this is the email that we get from people who say, you know, I never really thought much about it. I was just searching around for stuff and, and started listening to you guys. And then I've, and so many have said this, I've gone back to number one and listened all the way through. God I always muffled. feel sorry for them. Cause especially, yeah. I actually listened to number one the other week when we were preparing for this just because I wanted to see how bad it was. It was really bad. <laughs> so we got yeah. better. Two got yeah. a little better. And by 10, we kind of had our Well, we may down. be delusional to think that we've gotten better at all. But That's it, true. But there is no <laughs> doubt objectively really that bad. the first episode right. was a little rough. But, but it feels you know. so good that we can make a difference in our podcast and reaching a bunch of different people where it just makes them think. And, and I love that. So I love being able to tell them, yeah, go listen yeah. to a couple of podcasts. Yeah, it is interesting to me. I and mean, we do this. I mean, we have an interest in um, secularism and, you know, science policy and that sort of thing. But really, we do this mostly because we just find it damned interesting. And, you know, we're not doing this as the official mouthpiece of any organization. Um, so when we first started doing it, I just thought, well, I hope people will listen and enjoy you know, find us amusing or find us informative, but I'm amazed at the number of people who say, you know, I, f I felt so alone, you know, I, I, I'm a, um, you know, a postal carrier in Alabama, and I thought I was the only person that thought this way, and I just stumbled across your podcast, and, you know, it, it's very touching to me that people actually get that out of our podcast. 
And we actually get more of those than the, um, you know, you're a baby-eating atheist who's going to hell. So that's a good thing. Yeah, that is. I, I, I'm trying to figure out how we can expand our, our, our listening audience to get to the religious people. Because yeah. we do sen- t- tend to uh, preach to the choir, if you'll excuse the expression. But what can you do? Exactly. Okay, well, we could ramble on for a while, but um, if anybody has any questions or comments, and please wait for the microphone. And, uh, oh, by the way, I have to say, this is our cat. We have nicknamed him Histopher Scratchins. Get it? Okay. Christopher Hitch. And his favorite book is The Dog Delusion by, <laughs> by Scratch Hard Dog Kittens. Scratch Hard Dog kittens. Dog kittens. Very good. Scratch hard dog kittens. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, What's his this real is name? this is a t- yeah. His real name is Cooter. There you go. But anyway, we didn't name him. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you were talking about that list of items that the gentleman was referring to, and with listening to two other pod, two listen to two podcasts. Yes. And American Three Thought would be one out. I mean, are there any others that you would think about? I mean. I'm not sure if I want to introduce a believer straight to irreligiologists, even though they do have some good things, but are the ones that you think are good for reaching out to? Oh, sure. Yeah, I would recommend that um, people uh, either listen to the audiobook version or read Julia Sweeney's Letting Go of God because she, she personifies this why does it take people so long? And, sh- and of course, she's not only a, a very brilliant and... Uh, hilarious monologist, but she talks about her her journey from being a devout Catholic to finally admitting that that she's an atheist, and her all her roadblocks were strictly emotional. So, uh, and she tried everything, you know. Really, that I would tell anybody start start right there. No, that's excellent. I've actually given that DVD out to, or I think just the CD out to several people, and um, where they're kind of on the fence, and that really helped them understand stuff. Right. And as far as just pure podcasts, um, George Robbs, uh, you know, probably everybody here listens to the G-Logger podcast, and he does go into the ridicule side a little bit. He has a segment called the Religious <laughs> Moron of the Week, but but really, he is he just is such a, a wonderful guy to listen to, and he's so smart. And most of the stuff is right off the top of his head, and he says it like it is, and it's not challenging. It's got yeah, a little bit of barbs in there, but I would definitely recommend that. And, of course, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, which isn't about atheism, um, but they are, there's usually at least one segment in there about, about atheism as well with the Steve Novella. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I also have to say that when, you know, in a way I'm kind of a little bit like Julia Sweeney that it took me a while to become an atheist. I was probably 24 or 25 before I finally just said, you know, I'm an atheist. I mean, I went from hardcore Southern Baptist all the way through sort of vaguely Unitarian-ish, you know, uh, to pseudo-deistic and, you know, finally just came to the conclusion. And again, it was all emotional and just not not wanting to believe that, you know, all this stuff that I've been told when I was a kid is wrong, you know. It's, you know, you don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear that your parents have taught you something that you think is, uh, you know, demonstrably false. Uh, but I would also recommend that you give people a good reference Bible with with academic commentary because my mother gave me when I was 13 or 14 a copy of a, a reference Bible and I don't think this was her intention but when I started reading it and you know it was talking about how the the meaning of this verse is is not clear or you know this verse contradicts something else that was said you know someplace else uh, or talking about how you know the uh, Genesis wasn't really written by Moses which was a shocker to me uh, that that started me on my road to to doubt, so I think that would be a good a good suggestion as well. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm here representing the Fayette Free Thought Society. Uh, it's a group that was formed mostly by my wife Julie, with the motivation of Steve Yothman, who is the oh, yeah. uh, head oh, of the Atlanta well. Free Thought Society. Sure. And about a year and a half ago, she started it down in Fayette County. And for those of you that aren't familiar with this area, Fayette County is south, about 30 miles of here, and it's probably the stronghold of right-wing evangelical uh, Christians in the country. It's rivaling Cobb County, probably. Yeah, but uh, about a year and a half ago, we had three members, and now we have up to 120. Wow. And, Excellent. Uh, uh, we're reaching out to a, a meetup group. Uh, we have uh, scientists, pr- uh, professors, students, doctors, pilots, 
uh, you name it. We have everybody. We have people coming in over 100 miles from Alabama to uh, come to our various meetups, which we have about two or three times a week. We've also adopted the uh, the mile in front of the city hall of Peachtree City. Uh, which oh boy! Is, uh, we, and the, uh, the, our sign, the Free Thought Society, is firmly planted in the Lutheran Church, right there at the beginning of the of the Free Thought Perfect. Mile. That's great. And so we sponsor cleanups that happen every day. We've also sponsored uh, several debates. Uh, Maximo, who is here, was uh, came to visit us uh, about a year ago and gave mm -hmm. a talk. And uh, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, if you build it, it will they will come. And uh, yeah. we, you know, it's growing every day, and it's it's just amazing. We also have. On the local news, you might have heard lately, we have one of our members, Al Stefanelli, is, uh, has been there lately. He's challenging the city council of Peachtree City over their Christian prayers at their, their meetings. And now uh, we're, they're putting together a lawsuit to challenge them on those. So right. That's great. Keep up the good work. Yeah, that's excellent. excellent. Yeah, it is true that if, if you build it, they will come. Or at least, at the very least, if you don't build it, they definitely won't come. So, um, But I think it was, was it Blair Scott, I think, who's with American Atheists in... Um, Huntsville talked about how he started a, a free thought group and put a little ad in the paper. This is before the internet, I guess. But anyway, uh, I think he and his wife went there for six months or a year or something like that, showed up at the same coffee house at the same time on the same Sunday or whatever before the, the first person showed up. You know, But they just persisted, and now it's one of the largest and most active uh, free thought groups in the country. I tend to believe that there's you know, not really a God and that this is sort of all a happy accident, but I consider myself an agnostic because I can't really reconcile with the scientific method that there is, you know, absolutely no doubt that there is nothing out there. Right. And you were giving agnostics a little bit of grief earlier. And so, and yeah, you say that find our okay, everybody, here. let's boo agnostics. Yeah, there <laughs> <is>. <laughs> but I'm the kidding. thing is, I mean, kidding. you know, I just, I feel like if I'm saying that there definitely isn't anything, that's just about as bad as saying that there definitely is. You that know? is true. I mean, how do you reconcile that? Well, I guess the way I reconcile it is if, if there's no evidence for something, then that thing probably doesn't exist. That's just the default position. And the, the only difference between saying there is a creator God um, or saying there was this three-headed creature named Gozamondius that you know, sneezed and the universe came into existence and he has a pet pony who goes around and, you know, blah, blah, blah. They're both, there's no evidence for, they're equally uh, non-evidential. So for me to just uh, look at the evidence and say, okay, there's no evidence for the creator God, I dismiss it. It's the same as invisible unicorns or whatever. Um, and I think uh, the only reason it gives people pause is because this belief in God, specifically the Judeo-Christian God, is so common. You know, people just, you, you grow up steeped in it, and it never occurs to you to think that it's not a thing. So, and it's even hard. I hear atheists all the time saying, well, God doesn't do this and God doesn't do that, as if he's around and they're just, de you know, denying <clears throat> certain characteristics of God. So, um, I'm rambling. Yeah, and I don't have any problem with anybody calling themselves agnostic. I do kind of tend to, to think that it's it's just a nicer word than atheist, and that's why people feel more comfortable calling themselves right. agnostic. And, and it, there's nothing wrong with being an agnostic uh, in the sense that, and I think all atheists are agnostic in the sense that if they're honest, they are open to new evidence. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> of course, we get into the problem of how could you formulate ahead of time what would constitute enough evidence for you to believe that there was a God? Because anything you could conceive of could be a trick or it could be the act of a superior being that's not God. So even if someone appeared before me in white garb and glowing skin and, and you know, did a miracle or whatever, that still doesn't mean it's God. It still doesn't mean it's supernatural. It just means I don't know what it is. So. Yeah, well, I would say I don't know what I saw, but I, I you know, I, I could not infer anything beyond what I have seen. So I'd start believing in aliens, right? <laughs> if I saw that. Oh, oh, yes, ma'am. Um, you uh, spoke about different books. I would also recommend the Fifty Reasons to Believe in God by Guy Harrison. Oh yeah, I yeah. interviewed him um, on my other podcast. Which podcasts. is, yeah. I heard that. Ah, which is outstanding, <laughs> especially for folks who are longtime religious followers 
who just can't quite make that leap right. to and and I can say you know I'm like that too I've been in the church for 45 years and you don't just turn that off that's right you just can't but that's a great reference yeah, yeah. it's a really good book and if I didn't even talk about my other podcast it's a uh, secular world and if you go and search for secular world at Atheist Alliance International then um, search for Guy Harrison and we did an interview about that book so yes um, we have five minutes, so we're doing good. Okay, I'll try to be quick. So we got, we're professional now. We got the clock and everything. Talk also, slow. We got five minutes to fill. <laughs> oh, okay. I also. <laughs> okay, you can talk. I would you. like to second the Guy Harrison book. I thought that was an excellent book, um, especially when I was kind of tipping between the two. I um, maybe after I'm done asking the question real quick, maybe it might be good to talk about the difference between atheism, and theism, and Gnosticism and agnosticism in case some people don't really fully understand the differences. Um, no, not in four minutes, probably. So. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> or Google it. Um, I'm another one of the ex-Mormon, former BYU students, Brigham Young University. Quick update there. It will lead into my question. Uh, there is an underground group growing, especially, of atheists who are allowed there and even post-Mormons who are not supposed to be there. And so even even in Utah, Brigham Young University, the skeptic movement is growing. Post-Mormons, not ex-Mormons. I say post mos but it's, it's both. Interesting. Uh, so I work at a place where maybe three or four people out of 30 are not LDS, and I'm one of those. And so they'll talk about church life all the time, all the day. They don't want to hear other opinions. They just simply don't ask. Do you have any ideas or any opinions on, on your side of how I could be more open about my skepticism or ways to bring that up in conversation without just being negative on top of what they're saying. Right. Um, yeah, you've got a good answer for that one. I do? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I have to say that's something that I, I struggle with myself. I mean, of course, I also happen to think that your day job is your day job and, you know, keep it to business. You want to be friendly with your coworkers, but I don't, I've never mentioned to anybody at my work that I'm an atheist or or even that I do any sort of activism. I mean, if they found out, they found out. But, um, you know, I, I don't put it on them because I also don't want to hear about their, you know, church activities. I just don't have any interest in it. Uh, but I think you just have to kind of feel the landscape. You know, uh, I mean, I have worked at places before where you can eventually sense, you know, where that, where somebody is going. Like one day I was at work and with two of my other coworkers and, this guy was talking about somebody that they that t two of them used to know and the one guy got up and walked out of the room and as soon as he walked out of the room the guy looked at me and he goes oh and he's a bible thumper too but i didn't want to say so in front of him so that you know i'm like oh may he may be a kindred spirit i don't know but <laughs> you know it is it is tough but you know plus you you also don't want to get into a situation where you spend all your time at work arguing <laughs> with your right. co-workers about religion because then you all get fired. Yeah, the way that I do it, it's, is I just try to be the best person I can be. And it, at work, it, it actually works pretty well. People seem to generally like me at work. I'm not always a, a jerk like I am on the show. And then when somebody, like my, one of the, my cube mates actually, kind of decided to Google me. She didn't know much about me. You know, just sometimes you'll Google your friends and found out that I was an atheist that way because I'm all over, you know, if you Google my name, it pops up all over the place. And so she came in, she's like, David, I had no idea you weren't a Christian. You are such a nice guy, you know. <laughs> so, so it was non-confrontational, you know, she just, she liked me. And then, so I think I actually might have helped our cause a little bit by having a really fundamentalist Christian say, you know, geez, you're maybe not all atheists are bad. So you can, you can keep try that too. Just be nice. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we have one minute. So uh, just real quick to give you our contact information, we're at AmericanFreeThought.com. I maintain a occasional blog. I haven't been really good lately. Um, but you can email us individually at uh, John at AmericanFreeThought.com or David at AmericanFreeThought.com. We're on iTunes. We're on Facebook. I will, fr I will befriend you. Um, so we're on uh, Atheist Nexus as well. I haven't been on there in a long time. Shame yeah. on me. Yeah. But I do have an account. And Twitter, Ammer Free Thought. There you go. So cue the, the music. And. <laughs> it doesn't work as smoothly as it does. I know, it doesn't. Anyway, thanks very much for coming. We hope you've enjoyed our talk.